From the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Josh Kranzberg, in for Jason McClure. We bring you a special edition of the program today. It's America's longest running war in history, Afghanistan. This October will mark 17 years in the country with seemingly no end in sight. There have been countless images and stories from the conflict there, but very few capture the raw, unedited chaos, carnage, and even the lighter moments of our service members engaged in combat. The latest effort, effort gets you up close and personal with the 1st Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment. It's called Combat Obscura. The film had its world premiere in March at the True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri. And today, we're joined in studio by the director, Miles Lugosi. Miles, welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. So the first question is, why make this movie? What, what sparked your interest in making this film? Um, well, I guess... We'd have to start from the beginning when I uh, enlisted in the Marines sure. as a combat cameraman. Uh, it was my job to basically film the conflict from the Marine Corps' basically propaganda arm or their perspective, kind of like a PR guy for the military. Um, but while being out there with a camera as a Marine with a rifle and a camera, you have a kind of um, an access that you don't normally have because you're one of them. So while I was filming all this stuff uh, for the Marine Corps for my job, I was also seeing all these other things that were happening that people wanted me to film or that I thought was interesting or important. And uh, yeah, and then when I got out of the Marines, I kept the footage, um, mostly because I hadn't really quite gotten over the, the experience. I wanted the, to keep the the memories fresh and everything, but I also thought, you know, this is important. So. Did you enlist knowing that's what you wanted to do? Or were you? Or did you do journalism in high school and you're like, this is what I wanted to do? Or was it sort of a split second decision? Um, I enlisted as combat camera basically because, I mean, that's one of the jobs that you can do. Not everyone that joins the Marines is infantry. Like there's, there's countless jobs that you can do. You could be a cook, you could be, you know, admin, you could be a number of things. Combat camera is one of them. Um, I chose it, I think, because um, I thought it would kind of give me a, a neutral kind of distance to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't really prepared to, to, you know, go over there and kill anyone. I wanted to have that kind of distance. Obviously, when you actually get out there, you realize that the the camera's just as upfront and personal with everything and impacting things just as much, if not more, than. Uh, another job if you were just a regular soldier. So uh, you don't have the answer to this if you don't want to. Why did you decide to enlist? Um, I joined, you know, this is going to sound weird, but I, I really joined for selfish reasons. Um, I wanted to see the war. I wanted to go to war, not because I believed in what we were doing. I just wanted to experience it. It felt like something that I needed to to experience and that people were trying to kind of ignore back home and I wanted to experience it so it was kind of a selfish thing I guess did that change once you got over there did it become so so once you saw the war did it become I say less selfish or more selfless um I mean once you go through boot camp you're pretty you become a part of you know the culture mm -hmm. so you're no longer an, an individual with individualistic uh, ideas. You're part of that system. So yeah, it did change a little bit. Yeah. On the movie's website, it's labeled as the war you were never meant to see. Um, why is that? Why was it the, the, the war movie we were never meant to see? Yeah, I guess that's kind of, a, a you know, a luring catchphrase, but, um, it's, it's just what you were never meant to see. Cause it was never released by the military mm -hmm. because I was, you know, shooting for the military. And this is footage that never got released. So it also says on the side, you've seen war documentaries from civilian journalists, reporters, and independent filmmakers. Um, and it, it calls this different than that. How is this different than, say, a journalist who's embedded with a, with a uh, regiment for months on end? It's just the, it's the access that you have. It's the intimacy. Um, it's what people are going to be okay with you filming um, and what they want you to film because I was essentially I was uh, their camera for how they wanted to be seen amongst each other um, that's what 
I mean, you know, that's what it kind of was. Um, with a civilian, I think there's an awareness that this is, we're representing the military here. Mm -hmm. This isn't for us. This is for, you know, people back home to see. With me, it was, this is our camera. How many members, uh, how many Marines were in, the, were in the group that you went overseas with? Well, a battalion's usually uh, comprised of around 800 Marines. And so you, you sort of moved around, moved around, moved around and got yeah. different groups at different times. Yep. Did they, did you feel closer with one group or did you, did they, did, did another group, you know, um, sort of reluctantly let you film them or? Yeah, definitely. Uh, each platoon is, so a battalion is comprised of usually three or four companies. And within each company, there's uh, usually three or four platoons. And mm -hmm. those platoons are comprised of like 15 to 30 people. Um, and each platoon is different, you know, because the military is, is not one monolithic of course. thing. It's full of incredibly diverse uh, individuals and leaders and, and everything. So, yeah, each platoon is different. Um, what mostly what I wanted to keep filming was where things were actually happening mm -hmm. or where I thought the story was at the time. Um, but yeah, each platoon is different. Uh, what was the general feeling? Were they were they did they roll their roll their eyes when they saw you? Were they like, oh, it's it's Miles. Good to see you again. Or it was it depended. Like I said, on each platoon, some of them uh, you'd get to a platoon because even though you are a Marine, the infantry is an incredibly uh, fraternal and um, brotherly kind of clique, mm -hmm. sort of. You know, if you're not infantry, you're you're not even really a real Marine. If you're not that. part of the team, you're not part of the team. Right, exactly. So a camera guy comes in, even though I have a rifle and I have everything that mm -hmm. else that they have, um, you're kind of seen as an outsider. So just, in a sense, um, some platoons are, are less willing to invite you in, and some are incredibly, you know, yeah, come. They you know, wanted you to yeah. come in. Yeah. Like, my nickname was YouTube because they... <laughs> They wanted to get on YouTube because they thought I could get them on the internet. I guess. Vi internet famous, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, was there a specific story you wanted to tell, or was the, did you want a beginning, middle, end, or was it just more of a, a collection of experiences that that was guiding you? Um, well, I had my job, like I said, and everything else that was happening was incredibly fragmented. There wasn't a story, and that's kind of. That's not the main reason, but it is one of the reasons the way uh, the reasons the the movie is structured the way it is, it's very fragmented. I was gonna say uh, it, it did sort of jump around um, from one thing to another. Um, one of the first segments that that really uh, stood out to me was them joking around and doing PT uh, right before a firefight, and that included like like exercising their trigger fingers. Um, it, I don't want to sound cliche or naive, but is that really how it is that they're joking right up to the moment where they're going to start firing on, on enemies? Oh, yeah. I mean, Marines actually, it, like, I, before you see, before you see someone get hurt, fire, uh, getting into a firefight is, is, is fun. Uh, it, it is. The, you can't deny that. And when you're in that culture where that's your job and that's what you're supposed to be doing it's it's a necessity that you if you're not getting shot at it doesn't feel right and that sounds kind of weird but uh that's kind of the culture of, of, of the marine corps down not that square up to the left of it so yeah exercising before uh before a firefight you know? Even if it's joke in a joking manner, exercising your your trigger finger. Yeah, you know it's it's a joking thing, obviously, but um, there there is there is a, an aspect of of war that is uh, addictive. You know, it's that's and that's kind of what we're trying to show in the movie. Is it's in, this is an incredibly complex thing, uh, and we want to leave that complexity. We want to complicate uh, the issue rather than put some kind of narrative on it that's going to explain the war, hmm. uh, which is what I was trying to do in the beginning, actually, when I was I was making a conventional documentary, going around interviewing these guys from the footage. Originally, that's mm -hmm. what I was doing. Um, and I realized that I was trying to explain these things that were happening. 
and they're really not you can't explain them yeah it's tough it's tough for you um i I imagine it's tough for anyone to relay it to me as opposed to to just watching uh watching this film and and seeing it firsthand Um, a quick reminder you're listening to global journalists on today's program we're talking to miles lugosi the director of the documentary combat obscura an up-close look at a marine battalion in afghanistan the film premiered at the true false film festival in columbia missouri in march um, another scene that really stuck out to me, and I'm guessing will stick out to a lot of people, um, is watching them, watching the Marines openly smoking uh, hash. One of the benefits of being uh, in Afghanistan. The only benefit of being in Afghanistan. You're all accomplices to this crime. Um, it's not surprising that they're doing it. I mean, it's overseas. Stuff happens. No one's arguing that. But that they're willing to do it completely on camera. Um, did you worry about any repercussions? Did they worry about any repercussions about doing that? Uh, I'm guessing that, you know, well, it's sort of a don't ask, don't tell policy when it comes to uh, narcotics and everything, that seeing it on camera is probably another story. Uh, I mean, well, you see a, one of the guys saying in the movie, you know, interview me, interview me. And so, yeah, there was sometimes uh, an interesting aspect to, to filming them while they were on drugs um and for me at the time it was important because i thought there was kind of a vulnerability that Mm -hmm. was opening up there when when they were smoking or that like their inner thoughts would you'd be able to see them uh externally uh so it was it was always interesting for me to film that for some reason i was you know i was 20 years old all these guys were incredibly young put in this situation uh where they really have no idea what's uh, what's going to happen, and drugs is it's kind of like yeah okay war is a drug but there's also other drugs in there where you kind of want to uh, prove yourself. Um, not not necessarily peer pressure, but kind of peer pressure. It's like every you know I'm I saw a lot of Marines in that film smoking smoking cigarettes, and I'm guessing they probably went over there not not smoking until right. they get into. Yeah, but it's more than that. Uh, it's it's a test that you have to kind of pass. I think if you think the way I thought about it was, all right, if I can get high in a war zone, um, I'm not going to freeze up mm. in a fire. That sounds insane, right? I mean, I, I can understand that. You, if you're if you can operate while under the influence, yeah. you you don't you can't really think. You just have to sort of go right. off instinct. And if you look at the history of war, it's always been a part of it. That's very true. So uh, this generation is no different than that sense. It's just on YouTube as opposed to, uh, or in a documentary as opposed well, to. Well, Vietnam documentaries had it too. Uh, if you remember, there's a lot of news clips from Vietnam of guys shotgunning uh, opium and stuff through a, a shotgun barrel, you know? <laughs> Quite literally shotgun. Yeah. Um, have you gotten any pushback from the government, the Department of Defense, from anyone in the documentary about what was shown uh, in this film. Yeah, so uh, before I started submitting it to festivals, um, I, I sent it to, uh, the Pentagon has this office, it's called the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review. They, they conduct reviews of um, usually like memoirs and books that are being published by former service members mm-hmm. or like ex-CIA guys, just to make sure there's no classified information. Okay. Um, they did the review, and they said, yeah, there's nothing classified. But during that process, they also sent it to the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure why, probably to give them a heads up. Yeah, hey, this is coming out. Yeah. Just... Um, so they cleared it, and then the Marine Corps essentially like was reaching out to me, and NCIS, which is the Naval Criminal Investigative mm-hmm. Service, started like calling me and even calling my wife for some reason. I'm not really sure why. Um to basically find out what I was doing. Like what the purpose was for this. And and what was their response when you told them, I'm just putting out a documentary. This is not, this is not propaganda one way or the other. It's just, this is what it is. Yeah. And I said that to them and they actually, uh, they understood it for the most part. Um, They still didn't want it to go out, Mm -hmm. uh, but they did understand that this is just an honest, uh, realistic representation of, of the war. Um, Mm -hmm. So they did understand that. Um, 
I, I talked about the smoking smoking hash. There are a slew of shocking incidents, obviously, when you're in this sort of environment. I don't want to give too much away. Um, but one scene involved a chicken and um, preparing it for dinner. Uh, what was your reasoning behind keeping uh, gore and violence? I mean, obviously, war is going to have that. But what was your thought process between keeping it that uh, raw, no pun intended? Um. Well, I guess, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, it's not just to shock people. It's to show that this this process does kind of dehumanize you, in a sense. Um, when you see, there's a scene with a, a dead Afghan civilian, and it's spliced with the chicken for a specific reason, one mm -hmm. after the other. These images aren't just randomly selected. There's a purpose there. Um, and you can interpret the purpose however you want, but I do want to show that there is kind of, there's a way of looking at these, this country uh, as less than, hum as, as this kind of stance from American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. this is a shithole country, and, you know, these, these people are, ex you know, dehumanized in a sense by, by the, the military. I'm not saying everyone in the military but it is kind of part of the process. Um, there were, uh, speaking of that, there were lots of interactions, video of interactions with uh, Afghan men, Afghan boys. Um, was that was that intentional as well to see how the Marines were interacting with them? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and you see the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it's a very, there's a lot of paradoxes that, that come out and contradictions in, in their behavior. You know, one minute they're giving kids candy and the next something crazy is happening you know yeah i noticed that there there was a, a split scene i i know i'm probably not getting the order right but there's a scene where they were playing soccer with with a bunch of kids and chasing the ball around and then immediately cuts to or a few minutes later of them pointing a gun at a kid riding a donkey uh and, and cursing at them at the uh, yeah so that dichotomy was intentional yeah. to show just how quickly things can flip yeah um we talked a lot about violence there's a scene one scene during a firefight where you got hit uh, with a piece of shrapnel, or was it was an actual sniper bullet? No, no, it was. Uh, so they were sh they were lobbing uh, thirty mill millimeter grenades at us, mm. just like a like a grenade launcher. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I got a little shrapnel on my head. It was very superficial. I wouldn't even call it like a wound. I mean, but, but you were you were still. I mean, you were hit. I, I, not to the extent that others were, but what were you thinking or feeling in that moment, and especially when? Um, they they turned the camera around and you became the interviewee as opposed right. to the interviewer. Yeah, and that that was kind of a thing that occurred a lot where I would give them the camera and they would film themselves, mm. or in this case they filmed me. Um, I you know it, that I think that that question is asked a lot uh, f for people that film combat, but. Um, you're not you're just reacting you're you're not really thinking about <laughs> about anything yeah you're not thinking to yourself oh this is weird i'm on the other side of the camera oh do you mean when it do you mean i was being interviewed or? yeah when you were being interviewed i mean so like what was your so maybe not while you were being interviewed but looking back at it like going over the footage what uh -huh. was it like being like oh this is this is a weird process or, or were you used to it at that point what, uh, watching the footage yeah, yeah. of me getting hit. Of you getting hit and then being interviewed about the about the Well, incident. me being interviewed, I always hated it because I I, I hate seeing myself on camera. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the club. Welcome yeah. to Global Journalist. <laughs> yeah. Um, but watching it, uh, when I, I remember when I filmed it, I was extremely uh, excited, believe it or not, because... Mm -hmm. My whole, when I was filming combat out there as a young kid, I, I say kid because we were, you know, kids. Mm -hmm. I don't consider us men in a lot of the situations. Um, but um, I wanted to film as much combat as I could mm -hmm. and, and then edit it into a way that I had seen in movies and stuff. Like that was kind of driving me the whole time. So... I was extremely scared on one hand, but then, like, happy that I got this footage. Mm. 
So just a reminder that this is Global Journalist. I'm Josh Kranzberg in for Jason McClure. We're joined by Miles Lagozzi today. He's the director of the documentary Combat Obscura, which shows you the daily life of, Mar of a Marine battalion in Afghanistan. The film premiered at the True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri in March. If you're interested in more Global Journalist content, you can visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There, you can access archives of this program, as well as additional coverage of underreported foreign news and human rights issues. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, subscribe to the video casts of this program on YouTube, or get our podcast from iTunes or SoundCloud. Um, something that struck me throughout the film, uh, going back to sort of the joking aspect, but um, was hearing them brag or boast or, or sort of talk a big game, and then you know, about what they were going to do to the Taliban. And then when the fighting happens, you hear and see um, a very, very different side. Was that intentional, too, to show that sort of split? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess one of the main things I'm trying to do is is show that there there's no way to train for these moments. And the way that the film is edited, where it's just extremely, there's, you know, so much shaky camera where you don't even know what's mm -hmm. what's going on that's that's for a purpose like it could have been edited into a slick hollywood style documentary with that that shows okay that's what they're shooting at we can't see them but at least you know that they know what they're shooting at and uh you know cut 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 all these cuts that try to make sense of this thing um i really wanted to show that you you don't have con you don't have control when these things happen, um, and there's no way to be prepared for them. Um, one of the most harrowing scenes was uh, one of the Marines getting shot, and your team uh, and the team is is slings the guy over his shoulder over their shoulder to try to get him to uh, a pickup point. The helicopter has to go has to fly away because it was under fire, I believe. Right. Um, that that scene was hard to watch it was because it was completely unedited like you said no cuts no no reverse shots um what made you decide to show that specific uh scene that incident um uh i didn't want to show it actually uh for for a long time i felt really guilty just for filming it uh and i had the footage just sitting on my computer for a long time and i was trying to kind of deal with it um when eventually I called, uh, his name is Jacob Levy, the guy that gets shot. I called his mom and kind of like, was when I finally kind of like broke down and was dealing with it. Um, and I asked her permission to, if I, if she would be okay with me showing that. And she, uh, she was like, yeah, I, I want, I think it's important that, that you show that. Um, you know, not to use it as some kind of shock porn mm -hmm. but to show that this is what actually happens uh and there's so many documentaries and movies that really sanitize the war and that is we're really just trying to you know desanitize it and show it for what it, it actually is and i think that ultimately the benefits of showing it it's never it's never going to be perfectly ethical mm -hmm. There's just no way to, to do that, right, with this kind of stuff. Um, but I think hopefully the benefits outweigh the negatives. Did, did you feel that a lot, that, that hesitation to show certain things because of what was going on in them, because it showed maybe certain people, not because of who they were, but because of what happened to them? Did you feel that hesitation a lot? When I was filming or when I was When editing? you were editing it. Yeah, uh, like I said, I had originally set out to make a... Uh, a conventional documentary with interviews and a narrative mm -hmm. and everything and there was a lot of stuff that I, I left out um, and then when I started putting it all in there it, it was it became much more honest and I was realizing that as veterans we it's a, it's a very conflicted thing in this country being a veteran because on the one hand you're extremely proud because you've been through this experience that not many people have been through and you made it out um, and in the other there's this there's this kind of guilt that maybe you didn't join for the right reasons or maybe it wasn't you know the best thing and maybe mm -hmm. it actually made things worse um, and there's a kind of embarrassed aspect to it too and the way that people react to you 
uh, when you do tell them you're a veteran is they instantly say like thank you thank you for your service and it's just kind of a way of like you know not really dealing with it because they feel awkward about it too you mm-hmm. know um, and so when I started really putting all this kind of stuff into the movie uh, that I wanted to keep out it became kind of liberating and I, more honest in that in that regard yeah. we only have a few minutes left um, like I said in the intro the conflict in Afghanistan is almost 17 years old uh, I'm not expecting a, a solution I know it's about as complicated as it gets but um, do you see this ending anytime soon you've been over there what, what if anything can the United States do to it to do anything um, something that needs to change. What we're doing is not working. Um, so either there needs to be some kind of peace treaty where the Taliban is recognized as, I mean, that could obviously go very wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So there is no answer, I don't think. But what we're doing right now is not working. And certainly we can try something else, possibly. At least give it a shot. How did the Marines over there uh how do they feel about this, that, that we're not really winning, we're not really losing, we're just sort of there, we're just constantly there? Um, what, was, what was the mindset or what was the feelings from them when you were, when you were filming them? Most of the time it's, this sucks and I want to go home. <laughs> but there were other guys that, like myself, that really wanted to be there and experience that for, for selfish reasons or mm-hmm. for patriotic reasons, whatever. Um, so it was mixed, yeah. Most of it was just that this is pointless. Uh, tell me more about the uh, the interactions with Afghan civilian, civilians during this time. Did, did they feel like there was an end anywhere inside, or was it just sort of the same thing, like, this sucks? They're just caught in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, they have the, the Taliban on one hand, and then they have us. And they're just negotiating between two sides so that they don't get hurt. So it's a terrible situation for them. They're the ultimate uh, losers of this battle. We've got about a minute left. Um, what do you want viewers to take away from this movie? What do you want them walking out of the, the theater uh, and thinking or saying? Um, there's not really a message. Uh, the message is kind of just this is the truth. This is war and it's, you know, totally unfiltered uh, sense. So it's there for you to interpret it however you want. And I really want to, instead of trying to say something or or give you a message, I, I would really like to complicate this more than anything. You want it to be complicated. Absolutely. You want it to be messy. Yeah. Well, I think uh, after seeing it, I think you've, you've definitely done that in the best way possible. Uh, so that's all for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Our special thanks again to Miles Lagozi for joining us. Our producer this week is Edom Kasey with visual editor Jiwon Choi. Aaron Hay is our audio engineer, and Travis McMillan is our director. For all of us here at Global Journalists, I'm Joshua Cranesberg. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.